Hopefully we can underestimate the value that that international human rights clinic is going to have. Uh, we were hearing last night the Chief Justice was making an appeal for more cases to be brought to the courts to challenge the judges to make the Constitution more relevant in the context of human rights. And in fact, he spoke specifically about the preamble and the economic, social, and cultural rights that are embedded in the preamble. I'm going to ask now for uh, the program officer, EU Human Rights, specifically, Ms. Natasha Zorek, to come forward and give a few words. Mr. Sanders, Professor O'Brien, members of the panel, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, good evening. Most of us may know a woman who has suffered from violence at some point in her life. Such violence happens everywhere and across the spheres of society. It is unacceptable and it must be addressed with urgency. Following the new Sustainable Development Goals of 2015, promotion and protection of women's rights and gender violence is a priority for the EU. It is addressed under the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, the 1.2 plus billion euro global envelope for the period 2014 to 2020 from which indeed this project is a beneficiary. But it hasn't always been like that. In European countries, for example, it is only since 1990s that violence against women began to emerge as a fundamental human rights issue that warranted legal and political recognition at the highest level. And of course, the area of the states, it was recognized had an obligation safeguard the victims. Previous to that, cases of domestic violence considered private issues that often were not reported. And indeed, it is too often the case even today. In fact, the major danger facing us is accepting that status quo and remain, remaining complacent because it has always been like that. The biggest mistake would be to consider as fate what has in fact been socially and historically constructed by our own societies. This is not the world we want to live in, neither is the one we want to pass on to our children. Looking at Trinidad and Tobago, we all agree that the incidences of gender-based violence in the news and the social media of late are disturbing. But TNT is actually in a much more favorable position when compared to egregious human rights violations and abuses taking place in so many countries around the world. Admittedly, Trinidad and Tobago nonetheless struggles in some fundamental areas. By way of example, it was revealed just last week in a forum held right here at UB that in the specific case of domestic violence, the incidences of assault by beating between 2005 and 2010 in Trinidad and Tobago increased quite significantly from nearly 500 to 800 cases in 2015. Notably, in 2011, it was said these cases rose well over 1,000. For dozens of these ladies, these Incidents, as we call them, meant nothing less than the end of their lives. The physical damage that can result from such violence, including the loss of life, is disturbing enough. But one must also consider the psychological harm that can be inflicted. In particular, when women seek support and, instead of, and are instead made feel, feel guilty and ashamed. Many, therefore, choose to suffer in silence, and the cycle of violence continues. Gender equality and women empowerment, the elimination of all forms of violence against all women and all girls, and all other harmful practices, 
are a precondition of societal development and involvement and that of economic and social progress. Therefore, we are indeed extremely pleased to partner with Trinidad and Tobago and to support UV and the Faculty of Law in its own quest to advance and elevate human rights. I will just close by pointing to the fact that indeed domestic violence does not only encompass violence by men against women and girls, but vice versa as well. And therefore, at the core of things, we are really looking at a fundamental change of mindsets, wherein the involvement and the role of men and boys in tackling gender violence is of utmost importance that must be addressed right at the outset. This is why the discussion like we are having here tonight is so important, asking all of us to examine the extent to which our attitudes towards and treatment of women is shaped by society's long-held views on the place of women, starting with the definition of masculinity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to start the discussion. And I'm just going to spend a little time putting the, contextualizing the discussion. And then I want to make the point that this is a dialogue. So this is about your engaging. The panelists have only 10 minutes each, and they're all going to speak on specific areas that we think contribute to a bigger picture. The issue really is deconstructing masculinity. And I think the university must really be congratulated for, as the registrar said, trying taking up this issue and starting a dialogue. The Salises had a discussion um, very soon after the incident with the, uh, the unfortunate and quite dangerous statements made by the former mayor. Um, that was a very engaged discussion. The theme of that was uh, sexual violence, is it a political issue, a political responsibility? The two people who were sitting politicians were not in the room. So the discussion did not go where it probably should have gone. But that was their loss in many ways. So it's very important that the university is continuing this discussion and continuing this need to deconstruct the causes of sexual offenses and violence against women and children and male children in this country. Um, the global average we heard today uh, is a ratio of one to one in every three women that will suffer some form of abuse in her life. Think about that as the huge problem that that is globally. We have to have this discussion and we have to have it more. I also wanted to make a point that um, the Dean and I were at a workshop hosted by the Law Association this afternoon on gender. And at that function, there was a lot of time spent on unpacking the experiences of women, survivors of sexual, of, of sexual offenses, um, and how to empower women. So tonight is very important in extending that conversation about unpacking the masculinity and the relationships between men and women that lead to this type of violence. So that is what the context is about. I will um, very quickly introduce your panel, maybe not one by one, but I will let you know that the idea is that Mr. Gaman, Levi Gaman, who says he does not like to be called doctor, so hereafter we are going to dispense with that formality and we'll call you Levi, is that okay? Even you, as you have a dialogue, please address Levi. He's going to address the what. What is masculinity? What are the traditional concepts of masculinity? And how that has been changing, because it has what impact that has on identity and how people express themselves and their behavior. Then, Veronica Aragon, 
will be addressing the global perspective and how and developing the link between the traditional notions of masculinity and violence against women and how that's seen internationally and how do the international standards translate into domestic and national obligations. And then Gayatri Pargas will look at the domestic legal frameworks and how they have changed and the traditional concepts and how they're reflected in uh, the national legislation. And then Ms. O'Brien will be looking at the perspectives of the, I want to call them survivors, not the victims, but the people who have been um, survivors of sexual offenses. So that's the, the lineup for tonight. That's how we're going to address this issue from a, a number of different angles.